things that need to be able to get access to mm -hmm. what is needed out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we, we should have, for, uh, for example, a safer shopper program. If, in fact, a business abides by all the rules that are set out to en enhance the probability that someone can walk in safely and all the, all the everything is being met, they should be able to get a certificate, a safer shopper, pass it on the window of the business that you can walk in because they've taken all precautions that are rational and, re and necessary in order to protect the safety of the customer. But there's a lot of other things we can do, but why don't you tell me, talk to me a little bit about what's on your mind, what worries you most about your business, what worries you most about what's happening to, you know, to make SEIU workers, and thank you for your, your national endorsement. I mean, you, you, you in fact, are really up against it, so many folks. We, we should be, for example, having a circumstance where um, if we have the whole idea of the thing that, uh, that the congressman did in terms of the CARES Act was to keep people employed. And so I propose that we have, you know, not just an unemployment system, but an employment system, insurance. So that, for example, if you have 25 workers and uh, you only have uh, enough work for 12, you pay each, you keep them on the roll, all 25 on, you pay them half pay, and the federal government makes up the rest of the pay. So you're able to keep the workforce in place throughout the time. And uh, the whole idea is once you're fired, once you're laid off, once you leave, once you, the longer you're out, the harder it is to get reemployed later on, especially if, in fact, you're a minority, if you're black or brown. And so there's a whole range of things we can be doing. But Rather than me go through everything that I think we should be doing, because I've been talking about this a lot, tell me what, if, if, if I were, if I had a magic wand, what's the thing you would want me most to be able to do to help deal with your business, your safety, and what you think we should be doing to help promote and maintain access from everything to capital to employment for a small business, particularly minority businesses? Tamika, you heard that what the vice president said to you, and we were saying in the back room, just, this is your chance. He was saying. <laughs> really? I mean, I'm anxious yeah. to hear. You want to? She took her mask. Oh, right. go ahead. You're good. Sure. Um, you said that magic wand. And just regards to the pandemic and being a small business and having to open because the longer we stay closed, I don't make any money. You know, I don't get, I, I didn't get a large um funds for the PPP. I got what they told me that I could get, even though I was eligible for more. I am most afraid for my staff coming back. You know, most of my staff had newborn babies during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. yep. So them, they, they're more afraid to come back and contract the virus and take it back to their newborn babies. Mm -hmm. So what do I do when I don't have any more PPP? I've dipped into my savings already. I have to open, so I can't really open my store at 100% capacity because my, me by myself, I can't, you know, service everyone fairly and give them the service that they deserve. I, I can't fire, you know, my employees because that's my team. I, I, I appreciate them and I understand what's going on, but what do I do when they have to stay home but I still have to open and I don't have any more funds to be able to pay them to stay out? And I can't work at full capacity to be able to have income come in to run my business the way that it should. So I think if you had a magic wand um, and if, if it was up to you and you were in place to do so, to make it a little bit easier for small businesses like mine, not small businesses like, and maybe I shouldn't say names, but like the larger corporations that are considered small businesses, but to really make make it easier for small businesses that have, you know, anywhere between 20 and less employees to have access to capital, to have access to some government funds to help you to continue to pay your employees, to help you to continue to stay open. Let me ask you a question. Um, how, uh, how, how many employees do you have? At the, the, you, Originally it was six. Six, mm -hmm. but how many at the, you, you've closed, you have three outlets? And I have two, two and I had to close one. Close one. And how many were at that outlet? That you had um, so I, the one that I had to close, it was three employees. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the overhead beyond salary? I mean, in terms of rent, you don't have to give me a number, mm -hmm. but 
did you have enough money for rent, for improvements you needed to make to be able to c cope with the COVID, to be able to? Absolutely rent? not. And did you seek any help in getting grants to be able to do that? I did. And what happened there? Um, I was able to get a grant, and I, I was able to get a loan. I was able to get a loan from the Enterprise Center, um, and I was able to get a grant from the Merchant Fund. They were small grants. Yeah. They were... You know, and, I mean, and, and I know that it had to be spread around. I was blessed enough to be able to get those grants. They were gone within a day because my bills exceed yeah. what I got. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Congress has been talking about in this new act they, they've passed and the, the Senate Republicans are holding up is whether or not you are able to get uh, not just a, a loan for overhead but a grant mm -hmm. that – if you're keeping people employed, then you get a significantly more money to be able to deal with overhead costs. And that is everything from electricity to, you know, heating, air conditioning, opening the doors, whatever. And that is not a loan. That would be a grant. One of the things that I propose here is that we don't have very much information from a medical standpoint on what the impact of COVID is on a, from a parent to a child or a newborn. Mm -hmm. And so I propose we spend a fair amount of money in research, focusing now, for providing research now, where the medic, where NIH focuses on zeroing in on what is the impact, what are the impacts on, on infants, on young children of parents who are exposed, may be exposed to COVID. In, at, at their work because they are scared to death, as you said, that, my Lord, last thing I want to do is go to work. I could be someone who is not showing any signs of having COVID and have mm -hmm. it. And that's why the testing is so important for those people coming back to work as well, being able to be tested. But with regard to the whole notion of whether or not you're going to be able to restart a small business, uh, you know, uh, um, one of the things that, uh, as I indicated before, is that too much of the money in these programs has gone to big business. Most people don't think 500 employees is a small business. <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, and the mainstream business, the main street businesses like yours that have fewer than 50 employees, fewer than 20 employees, some as few as 10 employees, they're the ones that are getting, are getting crushed right now. And so uh, um, I think we have to have, uh, you know, uh, also another technical assistance to be able to provide small businesses like yours with the ability to have access to accountants and lawyers and others to, to how, you, how you apply for, how you qualify for, how you, in fact, can in take full advantage of what is out there that's not being taken advantage now. And, um, and so... Uh, um, I, I really think that one of the things that we have to think about is this testing and tracing. That also is going to take a lot of pressure off of employees who are coming back to work to know when they go home they are going to not be taking it home to their, mm -hmm. uh, to their, uh, their family, their, their elder, they have a, they're taking care of an elderly mom or they have a, a six-month-old baby. Mm -hmm. um, but it requires also to have all the protective gear and the safety circumstances required for your particular business. Every business is slightly different. And so tell me about your business. Tell me about the, uh, the uh, dealing with the, the eyewear. Do you do, do, you, do, you do testing? Do you we do. So we're full service. So I have optometrists that um, come in, and it was hard trying to get them to come back. We did follow the CDC guidelines for optometrists. And because they work closely with the patient, and then when the patient comes out as an optician, we work closely with the patient. So we have to be in close proximity to the person that we're working with. Mm -hmm. So we do try to take temperatures. You know, we do require everyone to wear a mask. We do have the hand sanitizers. Those things are running out, and it's very hard to get. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, when I need the supplies of hand sanitizer, now I'm going to the store and an uh, eight ounce bottle is $15 mm -hmm. when I need to buy 10 bottles of that to last me throughout the month because not only do I have to supply for my employees, I also need to supply for my patients or my customers that also come in. Right. I think that should be covered 
by the federal yeah. government. Mm -hmm. I think this should be covered I, I think too. It should be covered, and you no, no, but I'm but I'm serious. But it but but it is, and under the way the law was written, it was intended that it be able to be covered. But what happens is people don't know enough to know Correct. what it is they can qualify for and what they can get. Tell me, Della, mm -hmm. what you uh, um, uh, when people are coming into the center and their businesses are in trouble. What do you tell them? I mean, what's what's the most frequent thing that you get asked for help for? Capital. Capital. Yeah. But before we leave Tiffany's story, I want to make one point. I thought it was tied to it. I wasn't trying to leave yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> She's one of our clients. Okay. Okay. Is that um, Tiffany is a good example of an entrepreneur that was working in what I would call pre-pandemic, the old economy. We're now facing an economic reset and there's going to be a new economy. And so an entrepreneur like Tiffany, who required a place-based strategy of a, a client coming in her door to get glasses, and we had this conversation as we were waiting on you, is that she now needs to pivot to build a technology infrastructure for an e-commerce so that whether I go to her optometrist or not, I can send her my prescription. I can look online at her eyeglasses. And she can still generate revenue while we continue to figure out this COVID-19 pandemic and PPE, because she still needs to get business, but she doesn't have the dollars now to invest in that technology platform that she needs in order to be ready for this new economy. And so going back to your question and, and my response around capital, right? Yep. Is that as you were driving to this building here and to this center, you entered into a distressed community. And so one of my first orders, because I'm bossy, <laughs> is that as you look at these distressed communities, I'd like for you to change your lenses and look at them from a standpoint, how do I use my influence to convert them from distressed to prosperous? And how do we lay those sticks strategically to accomplish that? And one of the biggest things in these distressed communities is under supply of capital, right? I would like to see Tiffany become multi-millionaire. Me too. Okay. <laughs> Do acquisition. But we don't have the capital as a service provider to invest in her. And, and, and we don't want to be just debt lenders. We want to be also equity investors. So we need blended capital. Right? Because right now, when Tiffany comes to us, all we can do is make her a loan. And what we're doing, Vice President, is stacking on more debt, stacking on more debt. She'll never be able to grow with debt. It puts her in a position of where she is a risk manager versus a growth manager. I got that. And that's why this is not the totality of what I've done. As you probably know, I double the amount of money for this SBA and small business loans. Yep. Yep. And I yep. cut the interest rates on it. And you know all this stuff about I got that. another wand, too. Yeah, well, I tell you what. Well, <laughs> well, well, the other wand is that But what I was trying to get at is the immediate concern this moment. Yeah. One, we have to look. There's, I, I see this in two phases. The first phase of this is... <clears throat> How do we deal with the stimuli to keep the economy from completely crashing? And the second thing is, how do we then rebuild the economy? How do we reinvest in the things that are going to be the future? How are we going to bring people to a different place? Right. And they require significant investment. For example, significant. for example, we, uh, you know, I call for over a trillion dollars in increased spending by the federal government on infrastructure, including dealing everything from housing to uh, I mean, a whole range of things. I mean, there, uh, and in addition, we're, we should be moving in a direction that, look, I, I'm the guy that managed the $830 billion handed out in our administration in the Recovery Act. And if you remember, mm -hmm. you got a lot of it, and that mm -hmm. less than two-tenths of one percent was waste or fraud. But it requires a national plan, it requires a national coordination, and it requires to have a, a mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fancy word that is used uh, in, uh, uh, in Congress is that there should be someone who is able to look into all this. In other words, somebody follows this every single day that's independent of the president, right. independent of the Congress says this isn't being spent well. Inspectors general. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? This president's fired every inspector general. 
first thing I'm going to do as President of the United States, if I end up being President of the United States, is hire an Inspector General to go back and look at the entire $2 trillion you guys appropriated and spend the time with a fine-tooth comb going through who got it, yeah. who, who cheated, who in fact didn't deserve it, and pay them back and get it paid back, and or go after them for violations of the law mm -hmm. if they violate it. Mm -hmm. But, and that includes a whole range, we got to build a new economy. For example, you know, one of the things that is going to be necessary is for you to be in a position to be able to just right now, if you just had, you know, the ability to have considerably more telemarketing than what you have right now. You don't, I don't know whether you have that capacity now. But what I'm talking about today is the immediate need to keep bread in the table, to keep people employed so that when the economy does begin to come back and we do all these larger things, which I'll send you a 60-page copy of what I'm proposing, is that people are still alive. People are still, we haven't broken up more families. We haven't put people in a position where they're in debt for so long they can never get out. We haven't put people in a position where they, in fact, have given up and become very depressed for example, one of the big things we're going to have to do, and I know you know it, is significantly increase access to mental health. Significantly increase access to mental health. Not just for African Americans, across the board. Yeah. Um, and so there, there's a whole range of those things. But in the meantime, for example, what we should be able to do is make sure that everybody, for example, has access to, to housing. Everybody, for example, if, you know, we got to learn how to allow people to accumulate wealth. How do they accumulate wealth? Yep. They accumulate wealth, the vast majority of people, through investments in their home. They build equity in their home. If, for example, the homes of African Americans were valued at the same, the same number that the white home, the same exact home, yes. was valued at mm -hmm. because of the prejudice that exists, it's not, it would be a billion, it would be, excuse me, it would be $154 billion more wealth among African-American communities mm -hmm. just by the valuation of homes. Yeah. So there's a whole range of those things, but what I'm trying to figure out is how we keep people from drowning at the moment, mm -hmm. yes. at this moment. And for example, we, you know, if you're going to build, we're going to go back to work. How do we go, like for example, there are no standards. How we send kids back to school or daycare. None, mm -mm. None at all. None. What are we going to do? We got to lay that out now because how many, for example, I think every single solitary a person out there who has a child should have uh, child care. Mm -hmm. I think every single paid for by the federal government yes. if they don't have the income. Yeah. We were just um, discussing that with a friend of mine that um, even my job, they're calling people back, but they're calling them on a Friday and say report to work Monday. And like, what are they going to do with their kids now? Who want to watch their kids? Who can afford to pay child care at this right. moment if they had someone right. to and watch they, the kids? And so that's, that, they're, they're the things I think that we have to put in place now to get us to survive through this, to get people so they all aren't drowning, mm -hmm. so they don't, we don't end up in such despair and loss. That, and, but most of all, what, you know, we're going to have spent probably by the time, by January, close to three, uh, you know, trillion dollars to try to save people from total bankruptcy or save people from absolutely having nothing to be able to provide for themselves or their families. And how do we get that done? How do we get that done? Because we have to then, then we're going to come in with the real genuine, what we call, you know, rebuilding, the changing for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. For example, schooling. I'm sure people come into you right now. The, we're finding out that what we knew, I've been trying to get a, 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 a a $200 billion pass to be able to provide for high-speed internet for the entire country. Well, guess what? A lot of people don't have it. A significant number, particularly in rural areas, even more than in urban areas. Mm -hmm. But even in urban areas, at home schooling, how's that work if you don't have I'm a computer? Good. How's that if you don't? So no. what are we going to do about that? Because what's happening is we're going to find people further and further and further behind. And so from my standpoint, the way I look at this is kind of in two phases. How do we keep people from falling off the cliff completely, keep them 
on dry land up there, number one, and have them be able to move forward? And then how do we move them into a completely different circumstance than they were before? We have a chance to make significant institutional changes that exist out there. Like I said, we're one of the only civilized countries, industrialized countries in the world, I, I misspoke, industrialized countries in the world that does not have, uh, you know, child care, mm -hmm. that does not have uh, um, paid leave, that does not have all these things that, that people are, that affect their daily, daily lives. And so there's a lot of institutional changes that we can and will make, and we lay them out. For example, the proposal I put forward, I'm not going to bore you with it, it doesn't affect your day-to-day -day operation right now, but the proposal I put forward, every expert looked at, is going to create at least 10 million new jobs, 10 million new and high-paying jobs, not, not six bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, not even 15 bucks an hour, but 48 or 50 bucks an hour. For example, we're going to install in the first year that I'm president, over 550,000 charging stations in every new highway. We're going to own the electric vehicle market. Why should that not be us? But that's not going to affect your eyeglass business today, this moment. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole range of things that, and so what, what I'm trying to find out today is how do we build, for example, everybody's been saying, all the experts have been saying from the beginning, that you have to test and trace. You see what's happening when you don't trace. You see what's, uh, how, it's gone, how the, the, the coronavirus is, is escalating in states now, okay? Mm -hmm. Not all states, but at least 12 of them are escalating. And probably going into the winter, it's going to probably get worse. Yes. So wh what, wh what are we doing? Well, there are a lot of people that are unemployed now, particularly young people. What I'm proposing that we do is we have a nationwide uh, data-driven uh, uh, um, disease surveillance system. We, we need to hire 100,000 people now, now, as tracers from communities. We pay them a, a decent wage to be the ones who go out and trace when they find a new COVID case. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, only thing we know what's going to ultimately be for a vaccine mm -hmm. that's going to make a difference, that's going to keep things down. But we can do that, for example. But, but permanently, I think we need a new, entire new public health corps out there. We need to be able to provide for significantly greater care across the board in terms of public health. And that can, that, that, that can create millions of jobs across the country. But my point is that what do you do right now to ensure that there's worker protection, there's accountability, and as we reopen, we re reopen responsibly and put you in a position where you're safe when you show up to work and it's guaranteed you're going to be safe, where you're tested, tracing, going on, and the circumstances, the protective gear and the protective circumstances that you work in exist. And how are you going to be in a position now to be able to reopen and be able to do what needs to be done to provide for what you do in terms of giving people. For example, um, we're finding out that uh, uh, you know a, a lot of optometrists are in trouble right now because people don't want to go in and put their eye up against that glass and have someone else looking that close to them, and you know, mm -hmm. and they're worried. Well, what can you do about that? There are things that can be done to increase the diminish significantly the likelihood that you are going to be spreading the disease. Because even if everything worked and you had everything available, for example, what's your instinct is how many customers have come in right now if tomorrow you were able to say that you had no financial problems, you could have everybody back to work. Are you going to have the same traffic you had before? No, definitely no. not. That's my point. Mm -hmm. So this is not, I mean, this is why I wanted to talk just bread and butter about immediate things that can be done. Mm -hmm. Even if she had no debt overhang, even if none of her, she, none of her employees had children back at home or were worried about spreading anything, people aren't going to come in. So what, what enables that? Not anybody, but, yeah. you know, aren't going to come in. What you can do, and you're right about near term, you could begin to be able to get help in terms of how you have 
a business where you can go online and mm -hmm. say, send me your prescription, I can have it filled. Mm -hmm. This is how we'll do it. And tell me the doc that gave you the prescription and we will fill the prescription. Mm -hmm. We will, in fact, be able to do that. Or I need a new prescription, my doc tells me. And this is, so you can do a lot of, quote, telemedicine that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the first thing we have to do is, like, for example, you know, the idea you get, you get called back on a Friday, there's no one available on a Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, or a Tuesday, or a Wednesday, or a Thursday, or a Friday the next week to take care of the child. How do you get that done? Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I lay out here and I propose a significant child care capacity that we have to build, that we should build now and the government should be paying for as long as this crisis exists. Mm -hmm. And think of all the people who don't ask for testing. They're afraid to get tested, even if it's available to them, because of the cost. They think it's going to cost them something. And if they get sick and they have to acknowledge they're sick and quarantine for the days that they're sick or while they're sick, the cost or cost of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Right now, the President of the United States is trying to do away with the only health care policies out there. Mm -hmm. And you have millions of businesses, you know, major businesses that have gone out of business where you, in fact, you lose your ability. They've gone out of business, big ones, where they provide health insurance. They've gone out of business, and well, what do you have? You've been paying in half for that program. Well, I think under the existing law now we have, I think the federal government should pay the other half, as long as this exists so you can maintain your privately held insurance. But oh, the generic point I'm trying to make here is, and this is kind of, uh, you know, there's so much out there, is one, how do we enable you with surety to be able to go back to work and feel safe yourself, mm -hmm. number one, be able to ensure that your employees are physically safe, and thirdly, have a sign on the door that customers say, I can go into that business and I know I'm going to be protected because they've done everything that has been said that needs to be done in order to enhance the prospect that I will not Whatever I get in that store, whatever I get in that facility, I am going to get in a way that is not totally dissimilar that like it was before the COVID hit. And so that's why I, what I, and I, you know, we need to be able to guarantee that we federally fund paid leave for workers or caring for their families. We need to ensure that all workers that get sick from COVID for as long as they need uh, that they're going to be that their their costs are going to be paid for the, by the federal government we need all the things that needs to be done to make sure that you are safe and your employees are safe and your customers are safe is in the meantime paid for by the federal government now, you, don't, you shouldn't have to borrow that money this is a crisis this is a national international health crisis mm -hmm. and so if we don't do that, it's going to cost the government a lot more down the road mm -hmm. because if we can't keep these businesses open. What happens? I got what an idea. Sure. Um, one of the largest industry clusters for minority businesses is in janitorial. And so as we think about getting people back to work, many buildings like this are accustomed to regular cleaning. Mm -hmm. But now you have to do a higher level, which is called sanitizing. Yeah. And so here in Pennsylvania, a group of a minority and business and civic leaders have come together and formed a PA COVID task force. And we've been looking at janitorial firms and thinking about how we help them get their certifications and licensing for this higher level of cleaning. And so, Vice President, it's a way we could get people to work right now because, yes. because every restaurant, every business could put an emblem and say, this building was clean. Exactly. And, and sanitized. Be, and that should be paid for by right, the federal, federal government. government. I agree with that. Should not, well, that's part of what my proposal. Okay. Yes. All that's right. part of my proposal. The whole idea is how do you change the circumstance where when the press and all of us leave here, we would feel confident to walk into a building. Look, at, right. look we, we, we talk about essential workers, how we, 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 we are so... Um, you know, give them such credit. We clap for them. We bang pans together. We do the rest. Well, I don't want to clap for them. I want to pay them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pay yes. them a living wage to do what they, they do. do. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of them are losing their lives. 
you're going in and you're sanitizing that operating room afterwards. It mm -hmm. exposes you. Mm -hmm. The fact you don't have all the protective equipment these, these janitorial services don't have, mm -hmm. they should be able to get that because they're doing a public service mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in addition mm -hmm. to being able to get paid. Yeah. And again, there's go, well, there goes that big spending Democrat again, spend all that money. If we don't do this, we're going to be in deep, deep, and deeper trouble economically. Why are we, when we learned about the, the coronavirus the same time that countries like Germany and, and South Korea and others found out, why are we, in terms of on a percentage basis, why is our unemployment so much higher? Why is our death rate so much higher? Why do we have so many cases that have been diagnosed so far, compared as a percent of population, significantly higher than, I don't mean, obviously we have a larger population, but a significantly higher percent of people in the United States who have contracted COVID. Significantly higher percentage on based on the population that have died. Why? Because the federal government and this administration not federal. The, this ministry did nothing. They did nothing. The Columbia study at Columbia University points out that if the president acted just two weeks earlier, 54,000 more people would be alive today. Alive today. Today. And so that's why we can't waste any more time. Imagine the impact on the economy. I'm just being, just think of it in terms of numbers. If those 54,000 people were still alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so the thing that, you know, I, I think we have to create this Public Health Jobs Corps. Mr. Vice President, um, I think it was the Wall Street Journal said that 80% of Americans think that the country's out of control. So when you say about the soul of America, and you're in the district, in West Philadelphia, where I said earlier, these are fantastic people, they're very passionate, and they feel like somewhat, who's talking to them? So can you talk a little bit connected, because at least me, I think when you talk about the soul of America, talk a little bit about that in context of what you're saying. Well, look, you know, uh, I know West Philly a little bit, not a lot. The only reason I know it a little bit is I have uh, all granddaughters and grandkids that went to school here and lived up in, on, you know, 59th Street. And, you know, anyway, they don't, don't know, know it well. I don't mean right. to imply right. it, okay? Right. But I do know the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, really, really well. Mm -hmm. I do know my state has the eighth largest African-American population in the United States of America, mm -hmm. okay? My city is well over 50 percent African-American. That's what I come out of. I know it. Here's the point about the soul of America. This president, from the very beginning, from the moment he got, came down that escalator in his golden building, what did he start off saying? I'm going to see to it that we get rid of all those Mexican rapists. That was the first thing he talked about. Secondly, what did he do? He decided that he was going to pit us against one another based on race. Mm -hmm. When you saw those people in Charlottesville coming out of the fields carrying those torches, their veins, is, they're bulging and screeching at anti-Semitic hate and bile, saying, using the same phrases used in Germany in the 30s, in the early 30s in Nazi Germany, accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan. The Grand Wizard said, this is why we elected him, okay, of the Ku Klux Klan. And then a young woman gets killed and he gets asked, he gets asked to comment. And he said there were very fine people on both sides. No president in the history of the United States of America has ever said anything remotely like that. And so what I learned coming out of the movement much, much earlier as a kid is you think you can defeat hate. You can only make it hide. And when you give it oxygen, when a president speaks, no matter how good or bad he is, people listen. And when he speaks and gives credibility to these racist, I lost my language, 
folks out there. He breathes oxygen. They come out from under the rocks. And you're seeing it. You're seeing it all across the country. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, what happens? We then tile on top of that a triple whammy. Then we end up with COVID. And remember, I'm the guy that asked for the, the, the CDC to keep detailed reports on exactly who contracts it, exactly who, based on ethnicity, race, national origin, et cetera, and, and how many die. Because a friend of mine, the mayor of Detroit, told me what was really happening in Detroit, which I was responsible for in our administration, were people who, in fact, are people of color. Well, guess what? Why is that happening? Because of lack of access. And so this is something that I think, and, and then on top of it, the Floyd family, George gets, you know, brutally murdered for the whole world 